Welcome to Smith Weekly Discussions, an occasional program for our readers and listeners of Smith Weekly Research. Please note this program is a private discussion and everything contained herein is for entertainment and educational purposes only. With that, we hope you're in a comfortable position, along with your favorite beverage, to enjoy the discussion. We remind our audience to examine the show notes attached to each of our shows to better understand how our program functions. Before we get into our discussion, we want to say thanks for questions coming from our audience at Smith Weekly, including Jesper E. at Uranium North, Justin R. at EC Chen 1, Richard S. at Rad Baza, Benjamin H., Soup D., Stefan H., and Joe C. Justin Hewn has returned to the show today. Justin is founder of Uranium Insider, a uranium-focused market commentator and research group. You can learn more about Uranium Insider via their website, uraniuminsider.com. Justin, welcome back to the show, and uh, how are things? Thanks so much for having me back, Andrew. Things are good. Yeah, things are going well. Thank you. And uh, how are things in the People's Republic of California? (laughs) (laughs) Oh, they're crazy as ever. Uh, They're fine. We were lucky enough to live in kind of a small town in California, so things aren't too wacky here hasn't been too disruptive with either you know covid or lockdowns you know around covid but yeah we're we're doing good it's very it's quite unseasonably warm which is strange but um everything you know everything's going well for us yeah thanks for asking how about yourself well it must be all that hot air coming out of california but you know look whenever i can make a jab at someone that we talk to that still lives in california i make it a point and and nothing personal (laughs) I appreciate you asking. Things are fantastic here and uh, everything is really good and actually quite cool. So that's also a plus. Justin, we've got some audience questions, um, but really, what do you want to talk about first to kind of start off here? Oh, gosh. Well, we're more than halfway through the month of January and we had just a crazy rally in uranium in December. So that was kind of a, a sort of a surprise. I mean, it's uranium's one of those funny commodities where everything can, all all the positive fundamentals can stack up for years and years and years, and you just don't see results from it. And all of a sudden something just pops and there it goes. And, and you're all of a sudden your portfolio is up two to three X in a matter of six weeks. And it's just crazy. It was just a wonderful December for anybody, any, any of these long suffering uranium bulls who've been accumulating or holding for a long time. And it also was kind of a, a contrarian's justification in a way where it, it really just it really justified being early and quote unquote wrong because it just moved so unbelievably fast uh, starting you know the first week of December without the spot market even really moving. So it was difficult to understand exactly what was happening and but at the same time you have fundamentals that are just so good underpinning anything that's going on in the sector that that this rally is completely justified and um and we're ready it looks like the sector is taking a little bit of a breather here which is perfectly healthy and and welcomed and i think you know the coming let's say three to six weeks in my opinion from what i'm seeing i think we have a a softening of the market and probably a great opportunity for anybody who is watching the market and not yet positioned or wanting to add. I don't think we're quite yet off to the races, but things are looking really positive for uranium for the year. So that's what I'm watching. Well, certainly third time uh, could be the charm here. And it certainly worked out a lot for other situations. We had written that, you know, we hadn't seen enough highs yet to be completely confirmed. But since we wrote that, um, there has been some new highs that have been confirmed. And certainly we're very close to a potential real move higher and uh, really the end of the lows that, that you and I got to experience and got to enjoy as, as buyers and accumulators mm-hmm. of the stocks. That's a, a good thing to pay attention to here. And we're right at the cusp of that. And, you know, barring a liquidity event in the broad market, I think we really are very close to a fantastic situation. And if we do get that sell-off event in the broad market, that it'll be just a fantastic time to go ahead and just accumulate, accumulate, accumulate. So we'll see how things go from there. How about just on that topic, uh, one of the member, actually duplicate questions, um, broad market crash, liquidity event, like March 2020 is my suspicion that people still feel. Do you see that uranium equities really get sold or do they hold up, Justin? 
I think that depends almost entirely on what the spot market is doing. Um, I mean, if, if we have another March 2020, I think everything gets sold. Um, I, but I, I'm not expecting that to happen again. I think that we've entered a whole new realm of um, Fed injected liquidity that even if we see some selling off and some weakness in the broad market, which I think would be entirely justified at any point soon here, uh, I don't think we see an absolute liquidity crisis and crash anytime soon anyways. I mean, that's just my opinion. But, you know, regardless of, of the sell off that could happen in the broad market, I think if if the spot market is standing still or moving down, that we'll see we'll see a sell off in uranium equities. But I think that in the event of of a of a strong and consistent upward movement in the spot price, it's almost like I think that uranium can just stand alone and be in its own little world. That's my opinion, anyways. Um, so it's 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 hard to say. It it really depends on on what the spot market is doing and the sentiment you know, around that. And usually when the spot market is moving up, so is the sentiment around the sector. Um, so it could be somewhat of a cushion if we have a, a, a moving and a creative spot market while um, while the broad market is, is selling. So we'll see. Some interesting points in that and what you said that uh, I do think that there are some weak hands that have come into the sector. Now we encourage everybody out there in the audience to be strong hands. But I do think that uh, initially, if we do have any kind of significant liquidity event, that uh, there is an initial decline. But I also think that the response and the recovery will be very rapid, probably more rapid than what we saw in March 2020. So I think that can happen. And then the other part of it, too, is this looks more and more like a 2001, 2002 type scenario where the broad market declined steadily, healthy into a bear market where the commodity space, including uranium at the time, started moving up. And mm -hmm. it took a little bit of time, but I also think that that is a very likely scenario. And I know that uh, this has been looked at and discussed, we have in the past. That is a very likely scenario as people roll out of the overhyped markets and roll into commodities and places like uranium that will hold up very well and that other than a short-term crash, there's nothing in the broad market that affects the thesis for uranium at all. It's a really nice setup, and I'm excited to see how it goes. And I think we're positioned to, to see either side of that with cash to buy on the downside and then also mostly placed on the upside. So I, I think this is a great setup, and I think we're well positioned. Um, Agreed. How about 2021 uranium market? What is your biggest concern, Justin, maybe a headline or a question mark for you as we uh, enter into 2021 uranium market? I would say that my biggest concern would probably actually be a short term concern, and that would be that, that the utilities continue to sit on their hands. So I think that we, we know that Cameco and Kazatomprom are both buyers this year. We don't know how much Kazatomprom is going to need to buy. And I think we're going to have some clarity on that when they update at the beginning of next month. But I think that if the utilities continue to barely touch the spot market and accumulate what they can with carry trades and some short to midterm contracts with Gazatomprom in the you know mid to high 30s, let's say, I think that we could see a lower upside for the year. So let's say maybe we get into the high 30s, which is still fantastic, honestly. If we see a 30% move up in the spot price, that's totally fine with me. But my concern with that is that it's going to be an explosive move if they if they wait too much longer. So I guess that's kind of not really a concern as a concern. <laughs> um, I Honestly, I don't have that many concerns about the uranium market. I don't really see an influx of supply coming coming in and broadsiding anybody who's actually done a lot of work in the sector to to kind of get to the bottom of things. I don't really see where that's going to come from, especially with the prices that we're seeing now. I guess my only concern would be, um, you know, a demand hit coming from either a drastic change in um, political stance on nuclear energy for any given country, particular some of the larger consumers like the United States or France, that would that would be not a good thing for the sector. 
or um, or you know, or obviously a, a nuclear disaster of some kind. I don't stay uh, in, imminently concerned and worried about that, but that obviously would not be a good thing for the sector if that happened. Um, but I guess that my, like I said, my my concern is that utilities just they just don't they don't take action this year again, and they draw down inventories a bit more, and they they buy um, in carry trades and, and short term contracts. But then again, you know, long term, as a speculator, that's that's less healthy for the sector overall to have a price spike scenario. But it's obviously a lot better for for the investors and speculators because you'll see much much sharper, greater returns in a shorter period of time. I guess that's where I'm at with concerns. But I feel honestly, I feel really really confident in what I'm seeing out there right now. Uh, from an investment perspective and for the future of this of this market, short and long term. Well, let's say they do go ahead and don't do anything in 2021. I, I'm happy with that. I would love to continue to write checks, as you would as well, and, and a number of market participants would love to continue to write checks in basically a stagnant market where equities sell off or sell down because, you know, people are tired and they want to go into something else like gold, copper, silver, et cetera, whatever else is attractive to them, Bitcoin which is fine. Good luck. And uh, we'll have you back. And then the other part too is, uh, you know, Cameco is at a prom. I, I really think that the important question for them is how much can they buy? Not necessarily how much do they need to buy, but how much mm. can they buy in this spot market? Mm. Because I think you're right. I mean, look, utilities can sit and they have enough shelf supply to make it through 2021. I don't think that's an issue if they wanted to, but how much is available on the spot market. And I think the depth is continues to be a problem in the spot market. And there's another question from the audience that comes back to that in a moment, but backing up just a little bit, can you talk about for 2021, uh, what's your thought on where we are as far as anticipated supply deficit for 2021? And also with that, if you'd like to share some information, what do you see as mobile inventory at the end of 2021? Um, I think that we're looking at somewhere in the 25 to 30 million pound supply deficit for 2021. A lot of that depends on um, a couple of unknowns, which are one, how impacted will Kazatomprom be in 2021 from their well field development um, shutdown for four months last year? And how long will Cigar stay down? Uh, those are both unknowns. I think that Kazatomprom is going to have around a 10 million pound shortfall. That's my, from what I can judge, that's that's rough, very rough for the year. And Cameco, we know that they need to buy, even with cigar operational, they need to buy 10 million pounds roughly in the spot market. With, and with cigar down, that's another 750,000 pounds a month that they'll need to come into the market for. But um, yeah, I think we're, we're between 20 and 30 million pound supply deficit. and um, if Cameco buys 10 million pounds, because Adam Prom buys 10 million pounds, uh, I, I think that we are essentially going to work through any of that excess uh, mobile inventory that still remains on the market from the oversupply of the past decade. I think we're very, I think it's gone this year, essentially. I mean, when you say gone, you know, there's always a little bit lying around here and there, but I think the bulk of it that's been worked through by carry traders in the past five years. Um, I think we're just about down through that. The market is extremely thin, which is why I think utilities are staying out of the spot market. They know that any purchasing that they might do in the market is going to move the price. And a lot of them still have contract deliveries on the books that are partially spot referenced. So they're they're not really going to want to come into the market, push the spot market up with purchases they, that they don't necessarily need based on their inventories that are going to affect their books and their bottom line by upping their the the cost of their deliveries that are spot referenced. So I'm kind of seeing the, you know, the, the producers are going to do the heavy lifting when it comes to clearing out the spot market. And that's probably going to move the price somewhat. And then there's always the unknown of, of any financial players that could happen to come into the market, which um, I mean, judging by the way that the equities moved and the volumes that we saw in December, uh, it's entirely possible that we're seeing some funds start to take equity positions. And, you know, the next step from that is is uh, scooping up physical pounds and squeezing the market. I don't have evidence that that is happening yet, 
Um, but it's definitely something to watch for, and it could happen at any time. And Justin, what's your thoughts on what happened last year, 2020, when Chemical went into the market and attempted to buy some material? What's your thoughts on the fact that the spot ran up to about 35 a pound? Does that have any indication of depth? I would say so because it was entirely pushed by them. Um, and we knew that because you could see that the 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 big price spike happened at uh, at delivery to Port Hope um, at Cameco's facility. So you you had a, a premium at that delivery location. Cameco did almost all of the purchasing. You know, there there weren't really, I mean, maybe there were some traders coming in um, just trying to speculate on 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 the price run up, but, uh, yeah, just goes to show you that one entity comes in and does uh, a decent amount of buying and the price moves up. I mean, what did it move? 20% in six or eight weeks? Pretty substantial. So all, all this market really needs is a substantial move in demand coming from kind of anywhere. And it doesn't have to be the utilities. It could be the producers as we're going, we're about to see, we're going to see that in the next few months. And like I mentioned, it could be financial players at any time as well. Um, you know, nothing is stopping pretty much anybody from buying physical uranium besides having the, having the cash to do so and the cash and the incentive. So I don't believe that they can buy their stated volumes. I don't think they can do it because Adaprom and Cameco together cannot buy what they say they're going to buy. I don't think it's out there unless the price goes up. But then you have to ask yourself at what price are some of these folks willing on the sidelines willing to sell? That's always the big question. I know that there's probably some holders out there that their circumstances could change in 2021 where they might take a lower price or they might take mm -hmm. a higher price depending on what their circumstances are. But as you just said, with the increase that happened in 2020 on little depth, little mm -hmm. volume in the spot market, I think that's a fantastic indication and maybe I'm wrong, which is okay because we all know the end of the story. This is all, you know, sideshow. I really do think that for them to be able to buy what they really need in 2021 in full, boy, that's a question mark that uh, to me is probably the biggest for the market. Notwithstanding that, of course, we'd love to see cheaper prices on the equities so we can buy them. Mm -hmm. When you're coming down to the question of this little bit of light volume that's available, and what price the holders are willing to sell. That's an interesting one. That's where we're at in this market with these deficits and with the amount of material that's actually left to be purchased. And we're not even talking about the restocking need that needs to occur outside of the standard demand, which is also a factor that plays in. Right. If we're gonna go back to four to five year inventory levels for the US and European utilities, what does that mean for the market? I mean, that's a lot of pounds. Yeah, I totally agree with you. I, I think that the spot market is extremely thin because the number of players that are selling into the market has also thinned out. We're looking at, you know, Orono, they're trading our MUG. Um, they're, they sell historically roughly, let's say, four or five million pounds into the spot market every year. Um, Commonac is closing and is closing within the next couple of months. That's their mine in Niger that has produced, I believe, Commonac was what, three or four million pounds a year? Roughly for the past decade, I could be off by a million pounds there, but something in that realm. Then we also have, uh, you know, their share. I think they get 30 something percent, maybe closer to 40 percent of cigars off take and cigars offline currently. They also get an off take from MacArthur that's offline, but that's been offline since 2018. Lastly, they have a JV with Kazatomprom, their Catco mine in Kazakhstan. And, you know, that's being impacted as, as well from, um, four months of, of lack of well field development last year. So it's it's highly likely that they're at the very least less of a seller into the spot market, which could be a big development if that happens. Um, yeah, it's it's a tight market. I mean, the spot, the spot, primary spot players are you have BHP with their Olympic Dam mine that's, you know, around 8 million pounds a year of uranium. And not all of that is sold right into the spot market. I believe they do sell some in primarily spot reference contracts but uh the other you know uranium one is also a spot seller and all you know all of their mines are jvs in, in kazakhstan as well so we're gonna they're gonna have some impacts from last year's shutdown this i mean there's no other way to describe the market besides fragile 
and you know the only thing that's keeping this thing from really running right now is is utilities having some inventory and uh some players such as cuz Adam Prom being willing to sell into contracts into you know shorter term contracts so i think i think Camico is perfectly happy with quietly buying and the, you know, they're not doing it right now i think they were doing some buying in, in the last quarter of uh, of last year but it seems like there's been barely anything moving in the spot market this year 100,000 pounds traded um so far in 2021 and so I, but i think that they're happy to accumulate as much as they can as quietly as they can as cheap as they can so that Kazad and Prom and or utilities traders and or potentially financial players can do the heavy lifting and moving the market and that's that's i think where we're at right now yeah, I think that's correct. And Cameco, as I've said, while they have a quite a debacle, I think that they can continue to buy material. They have some excess credit that they could tap. Um, certainly could issue bonds that would work for them, given mm -hmm. what they did with the bonds before. But at the same time, how far are they willing to buy on the spot market? Are they willing to buy $40 pounds on the spot market and then add on their GNA, CNM, <clears throat> and turn around and sell into a contract? I'm skeptical on that price point, but we do know they have some cash and they can lose some money really for at least one to two years to make it work if they had to. Very interesting situation, fantastic place to be. And uh, again, mm -hmm. if we can get equities cheaper, and I know we've been stuck on cheap for the last couple of years, Justin, but uh, you know, look, if we can get them cheaper, we'll take them. And yeah. I'm happy to do that. I, I know there's a lot of people out there that are willing to do the same. Uh, another question, and I quote the author here, in Justin's Uranium newsletter, he focuses on nine companies. Does he consider adding more to the list? Does he personally own more stocks and other companies apart from the companies on his list? And is he afraid of missing out on some of the other great companies? Oh, I think all investors are afraid of missing out on, on you know, you, you, you can't be in every single winner. Um, and we, we try to keep things slimmed down because a concentrated portfolio, um, within a sector is, it has much more leverage. Um, otherwise you might as well just buy an ETF. So the whole point of, of us making choices and keeping it, keeping it at 10 stocks within the uranium sector is because we are digging into the companies in order to make those calls and finding value in that research is really what what it's all about for us um, if you want exposure to uranium without doing that then you know you might as well just own an etf if you want to own 15 20 25 positions i mean there's only 60 companies in the entire space so if you want to own 25 positions i just don't see the point of that besides buying an etf um, do I own other stocks? I do own other stocks, but not in the uranium space. So I, I, I speculate in other sectors as well. I do a bit of trend following trading just in, in a personal account. But as far as uranium goes, I, I own exactly what we recommend in our newsletter. And I certainly agree with the uh, concentrated approach makes uh, by far the most sense. And we've tried to mimic that over here as well. Um, have a, just a few more positions than you do, but definitely we're not here for ETFs, we're not here for physical funds, and we're not here for the majors. If you're going to be in this sector and you're going to take the risk, you have to certainly go for the throat. I think that uh, the junior space is the only place to do that. Well said. Justin, what is your estimate for Kazataprom's 2021 production, and do you see that their production continues to reduce through 2023 or until incentive price plus lead time starts? Well, they have already announced that they are not planning on increasing their production back up to their um, subsoil use agreement uh, levels. So they're through 2022. So for, for this year and next year, they're predicting, I believe, what is it, 23,000 tons, which is about 60 million pounds. Um, that's what they're forecasting for this year and next year. However, we haven't heard an update from them this year, and I believe that's coming February 1st. Um, I think that they're going to be off 10 million pounds this year, potentially. Um, that's based on my own calculations of the 
the delay in acidifying the ore body after drilling the well fields that they resumed in August um, and when the peak production happens from that. Basically, the well field production that they that they halted for four months from April to August, when they resumed that, those wells that they were drilling in August, September, those don't get acidified until now-ish, December, January, February, and it takes some time for the ore body to be acidified before production even starts. So I don't expect peak production from the wells that they were drilling after the halting of last year to happen until probably Q3, Q4 of this year. So I, I think, I honestly think that they, they could be between, let's say, let's say 50 to 55 million pounds. And that's, that's total. That's all in. That's not attributable. So because Adam Prom specifically, they have, I believe they have 50, around 55% attributable. So 55% of 50 million pounds, what is that? 27, 28 million pounds, because Adam Prom, that's what I'm seeing for, for 2021. 2022, they should be back on track without any further um, interruptions this year. I think that they'll be back at their full production, which should be, you know, 23, 24,000 tons, you know, 60, between 60 and 62 million pounds, roughly, if my math is correct in my head. Um, I don't have it in front of me, but I think it's somewhere in that ballpark. I personally don't believe that they have the capacity to ramp that uh, everyone is kind of fearing. And they also have a lot, a lot of their production is in offtakes already. It's already, con- it's already um, committed to China, to India, uh, and all of their JVs. So what Kazadamprom is incentivized to ramp, it's just not really there. Now, if we see prices really skyrocket, they might throw as much capital as they can at rapidly developing their well fields. But even then, um, you know, looking looking at the geology that they're at, you know, th- there's a similar situation in oil and gas where you it's called high grading. And you always go after the highest grade part of the deposit first, and the economics decline. And you can even see this on Kazatomprom's expected production, you know, out over the next 15 years that their production peaks in the later part of this decade and then starts declining and it's like it's they don't have an endless amount of uranium and the deposits uh you you go for the nose first and that's the highest grade part of these deposits and so even if they did throw a lot of capital at it with rising prices i don't think that they can push out as much uranium in a ramp up as they did you know in the early part of the last decade where they were growing you know, by 10% a year or something like that. It was unbelievable. Um, so I'm not really worried about Kazadam from ramping up. And I think that they're off, you know, at least five, potentially up to 10 million pounds in 2021 from the halt last year. And they're probably back to normal for 2022. Justin, I think they have a capitalization problem mm. with getting back to those numbers. And I think everything will be delayed from here. The 2021 numbers, total global again, will be very similar, I think, to 2020, plus or minus 15 million pounds. I might be wrong, but that's okay. And in addition to that, certainly the mobile inventory is, and again, I think I stated a number in 2020, somewhere between 60 and 70 million pounds, and that's pretty conservative. It could be less. But if Kazataprom does somehow find the money and to ramp up and really go after it, assuming at a reasonable price, which I don't think they're at right now. When you include that with the remaining global restart capacity, I find that even with all global restarts and Kazata Prom, we are at market balance. What's your thoughts on that? And that assumes that there's an incentive price of 50 to 55 a pound uranium really to get back to that global balance in the market. And, and again, that's just balance. That doesn't include restocking. What's your thoughts? Yeah, I think you're you're pretty much right on with that. I think MacArthur back online, because um, Adam Prom at full production and uh, Lanker Heinrich online, we're basically at a balanced market. But the way that the contracting cycles work, it's not like, okay, we have supply and demand in balance, therefore the price stagnates. Um, it really has to do with where that production is going. and um, and how much those producers are willing to sell it for. 
and what sort of bidding war are we in? Like I mentioned, you know, the only players in this are not necessarily the utilities. You have traders involved that are speculating, that are buying pounds to hold, to sell into the future. You have physical funds that are doing the same. And you have the, um, the high likelihood that financial players will step into this market. And what that and that happened, you know, the, the, the fuel buyers for the utilities, a lot of these are old school guys that experienced the last market. They've got fresh memories of this and they they very, very well remember how badly the market was squeezed by the financial players. So for those of you thinking that a balanced market equals a dead market when it comes to um, the equities and speculating on, on an investment, I, I don't think that's what's going to happen. And it's just not the way that this market moves. It's you have massive uncovered utilities is starting you know three years out three years four let's see where are we at 2024 the majority of u.s utilities are uncovered in four years and um, the majority of european utilities are uncovered in about six years so you have a contracting cycle that absolutely will happen unless all of the producers are willing to sell into the spot market and into carry trades into the short-term contracts and we already know that Cameco is not. So Cameco is the big player here. They've got 18 million pounds uh, annually coming out of MacArthur when it's back online. They've already said that they're not announcing that restart this year. So they announce it, let's say 2022, first year production, let's say 2023, you get 4 million pounds. So we're 2024 before they even get to full production. And those pounds are going into term contracts you know at 45 bucks a pound or more so it's just such a strange market because you have the big producers that are unwilling to sell unwilling to restart idled supply um, until there's higher prices and then you have utilities that have no incentive to voluntarily pay those higher prices when they can still currently buy you know carry trade and midterm i mean a utility can right now go buy you know, a couple million pounds for three year delivery at 35 bucks. So why are they gonna sign a seven to 10 year contract at 45? They're not, they're just not gonna do it. So this is why I think it's it's almost inevitable that, that we see a price spike situation because these suppliers are not gonna come online until they have those prices and the utilities are not gonna pay those prices until they have to. So it's almost like it's inevitable that the thing gets squeezed. Yeah, I think that, Let's let's not consider the, the fuel cycle lead time in all of this, mm. but the balance doesn't occur until 50 plus. And again, that's a little bit conservative. I mean, people think that things like Langer Heinrich startup at $40 uranium, right? <laughs> that's not going to happen. No, uh, that's another question I have here in a moment. But look at it from a perspective of 50 a pound, 55 a pound. Then you start to see some of these idled projects come back online, obviously besides the, the Cameco's and the Kazata problems of the world, but all the other stuff. And when you look at and you model out all the other stuff besides Kazata Prom and Cameco, you can start to you know put a finger on where the numbers come in. It, it's very interesting. And then on top of that too, to get to the balance level, by the time that happens, plus all the lead times here that we've talked about, the restart process, uh, some of the, the smaller, crappier projects, eight months, 12 months. Some of the big projects, 18 to 24 months. When you add all that together, well, this is actually a pretty long lead time situation. Mm -hmm. And so that doesn't even include when we get to the price point that they make those decisions. So $45, $50 a pound, they start making those decisions. Then the clock starts. And then next, right. what about the restocking part of it? The European and U.S. utilities today are under what they are have historically had for inventory, lead time, runway. How many years of inventory do you have? And so when they start to restock, we all know that they come in together, generally. Who's going to be there to fill that restock? Aside from the existing consumption from the reactors, who's going to be there for the restock? That's the other part where you have to get into, okay, what projects get financed, what projects get built, commissioned, and operated? Obviously, we know the lead times there. We know that those are some of the easiest are at two years, and some of the biggest and most popular ones could take seven or eight years. It's really an interesting setup, and the lead times, I think, hasn't been factored in yet, but we're certainly getting there. 
one of the questions from the audience, Justin, was uh, do you think that there will be a restart plan for Langer Heinrich this year in 2021? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, there, if we see the price really start to move and if Paladin sees some interest from utilities willing to, um, willing to secure some contracts, and I believe that they've stated that they're going to seek uh, they're going to seek a certain amount of capitalization from uh, from contracts, but they also have um, they they have their Chinese. I think it's 25% owner uh, is going to be more than willing to front a lot of that capital for their restart. But I don't think that they're going to plan to restart until they can really see the writing on the wall for prices. So, you know, I, I believe Paladin said that they want you know 50 minimum 50, but 55 to 60 is really kind of not only just their all-in sustaining cost, but you you get into like a fully allocated cost that includes you know the cost of capital and in the cost of non-operation for all of these years. You know that has to be worked into into what it's going to cost to bring this mine back online. So um, you know if we see if we see strong price move it into the 40s in 2021, there could be talks about you know potentially bringing it online for 2022, 2023. But I'm kind of not betting on that. They got to factor in the parties, the uh, the five star travel, the limousines, and everything else. So <laughs> I think that adds up, and, and certainly yeah. most of them like that. And and most of them say that their costs are lower. And we know that they state that. We know that that's not truth. But nonetheless, and that applies to all of them, not just picking on Paladin. I'm picking on right. all of them. But you know, certainly the real costs um, you can start to delineate and. There's a lot of historic filings that, that actually give you a pretty good insight on, on what the true costs are, even though they wouldn't say it today. I guess on that subject, another audience question here. How do you know if a company has excellent management or not? And what are the factors that you like to look at and criteria to determine what is really the better company? I think that excellent management has a number of elements. It's it's not just one factor. It's you know, they say that the that a, that a quality stock, a quality company in the resource space has the three Ps. They've got the project, they've got the people, and they've got the promotion. And I think that without one of those, you don't have an ideal investment case. So there's, you know, there's there's management teams that I absolutely love that they've done well historically. They run the company in a very respectful way towards shareholders. Um, but they just do not have the promotion. They don't seem to have a grasp of what it takes to remain relevant in not only a bear market, but the beginnings of a bull market. And I think that it really takes sharp management to operate a company uh, responsibly, try to keep GNA expenses down during a bear market. You know, these things matter less in a rip roaring bull market, just everything moves. And I think that management can go hog wild and it doesn't affect the investment case that much. But I think, you know, the, the past three to five years has really been a vetting process for a lot of management teams, in my opinion, uh, to, to look at how much dilution has happened and to look at what that dilution has done for the company. So if you're issuing shares and you've got a 10, 20 percent dilution in one capital raise, well, where did that capital go? Uh, it's really, really important to look at these things, especially in a bear market or a market that's consolidating. Let's say it's been flat-ish for the past couple of years, which uranium has up until recently, up until, let's say, March of last year and then especially December. I like management that treats shareholders with respect, not with disregard. I like management teams that treat retail, I should say, shareholders with respect and not with disregard, even the smallest shareholder. And then I like management that is attempting to see what's coming down the pike and making moves to plan for that, whether that's acquisitions, whether that's consolidations, whether that whether that's purchases of property, whether it's exploration, whatever it might be, it could be any any number of those factors. And then lastly, I think that management has to have the right amount of promotion. I think too much promotion can um, can obviously hurt not only just in GNA marketing costs, uh, but it also doesn't always look that good when there's when the promotion is out of balance with 
the integrity of the projects, I say is, is something that I look for. But it's difficult to find um, a management team that has all of that, but that's what I look for, generally speaking, in management. And you know, obviously if management has done something before that's been positive for shareholders in uranium, that would be um, either they have successfully built a mine, that's, that's no small undertaking, that's a big deal. If they have, um, in, if they were around in the last uranium bull market, how did they perform for shareholders? What did they do with their companies then? Um, and I always suggest to folks to to contact management. You know, do do some studying up on a stock that you're interested in. Come up with a half dozen informed questions and call them and and pick their brains. And and you you'll either you know you might get a good gut feeling. You might get a bad gut feeling. You might get the feeling that the management has much more planned than what you would ever see reading their presentation. You know, all these little things matter. And th these are all things that we look at thoroughly. I generally agree with your thought process on much of that, Justin. And uh, I think that's a good starting point for a lot of folks to do their own work. You know, look, if you look at uh, some of the performances during the last cycle and you identify some of the management teams who did those performances and you look at their track record, I think that that also is a great place to uh, to start, and you can come up with a couple companies that way. I certainly encourage folks to do the due diligence, look at the historic filings. It's all out there. You just got to look and grab it. I think that that's important to do. Justin, switching gears, what are your thoughts on the rare earth market here? Well, that's a tough one. I mean, as far as I can tell, honestly, the rare earth market takes a lot of speculation on US politics because China controls, I think it's 80% of the rare earths market. Uh, and without getting too deep into politics, from what I'm seeing, I don't believe that the tensions between the US and China are going away. Um, let's just leave it at that. I think I think it has a potential for, to, for rare earths to really, really run hard. That's that's kind of what I'm what I'm seeing here. Now I could be wrong on that. I, I don't spend nearly as much time in this as, as primarily and focused on uranium. But I think you know that market is so controlled by China that you just have to watch what's going on with China. And to the extent that the U.S. or Canada even can import and you know rare earths from China or whether they cannot, that's really what's going to move the price. From what I can tell, at this point in time, this could change next week. I mean, this could change on Wednesday. I don't know. <laughs> so uh, I, th I think it has great potential. I mean, either way, I think there's good potential for that market. Yeah, we don't have a lot of expertise in that sector. I'm happy to admit that. But definitely, there are some other places, I think, that can fulfill that. And that's why we're focused in uranium, obviously. And there's some other places that can mm -hmm. certainly catch some attention. Justin? What kind of returns have you generated and where have your best returns in the sector come from as far as uranium? Um, we, let's see, I haven't calculated it today, but the last I calculated, I think at the end of last week, our portfolio was up 176% since, uh, since inception. So that's from 18 months ago. Um, I mean, we had a phenomenal December. I, we, we were up 120% in December alone, which was just nuts. Um, the best returns have come from a couple of smaller cap stocks that are no longer smaller cap stocks. The uh, developer explorer stocks that um, just had a really strong belief in management and the goal of the company, uh, recognizing those early before the market did is really where, where we did well with our best performers. Okay, great and uh, good performance. Um, I don't think everybody can attest to that. And for the audience who wants to, to pin Justin down on calculations, you know, I'm sure he would be willing to share any info that you need. But I don't even think we perform that well. So good on you. Thanks. I think that there's a lot to come down the pipe here, and, and we're just getting started. It's a bit of a rounding error, I think, still. Yes, um, agreed. Here's another question, and I and I quote this one again for you. In the 2007 bull market of uranium, we had a feared shortage of uranium, but no real de deficit and spot went crazy. But now 2021, we do have a supply deficit. 
mines shut down, with some in January and March permanently to be shut down, large producers buying on the spot market and the spot barely moves. Doesn't this prove that the market is very oversupplied against what most analysts think, end quote? And Justin, I'll save my comments here, but uh, I'd like your comments. I mean, to some extent, yes, it proves that the market has been oversupplied. The fact that we've seen deficits, this is the third year running now of deficits that was exacerbated by COVID last year. Um, I believe we've worked through the majority of that oversupply at this point. So um, yes, I mean, 100%, it proves that there was and there has been a really big oversupply. And that's the reason that we had that bear market. The fact that we have an existing supply deficit and the price isn't moving is not indicative necessarily that there still is drastic oversupply because of the ways that the market moves and the ways that the utilities purchase um, that we've already kind of discussed. So um, in a lot of ways, it's structurally a better setup than the previous market. Um, there's definitely some differences. There are, you know, there's underfeeding coming from enrichment. The enrichment uh, in the last market was a different type of enrichment. And now it's um, gas centrifuges. So these centrifuges have excess capacity to spin the tails material into sellable enriched uranium. You know, it's 20 million pounds a year that comes from enrichers. But we, and we also have Kazatomprom now. I mean, Kazatomprom was in the early stages in the last bull market. So they were just kind of up and coming, where now we have a, a huge producer that's, that's relatively consistent that I think, you know, sort of, it doesn't balance the market, but it's kind of like this foundation to the market that we didn't really have before. The last market was speculating on a new mine coming online, which was Cigar Lake. And the market was expecting that production to happen. And then Cigar Lake flooded. And the spot price really took off. And the hedge funds came in. The spot price really took off. But fundamentally, the setup is stronger for a mid to long term bull market. And the current price action doesn't prove oversupply. All it proves is lack of buying. So it proves that there's inventories. The utilities have inventories. And they're not yet really entering a, a contracting cycle. But the fact that we will remain in deficit until they do practically guarantees that we that we see these higher prices and we we will see utilities buying in order to get the market to the balance that it structurally needs. Yeah, the only thing I would add there is the spot market has barely moved because there's been very little volume. Right. And we saw the move last year from, you know, call it 28, 29 to 35 or whatever it was. That just goes to show you where it's at. So I, I think the question, interesting question, but again, do a little bit more depth, do a little bit more research, and your question will get answered. Justin, how about data sources? And this came from another question about just kind of tracking some of the key areas of the market. There's not much for real time, but what data sources would you refer people to who want to keep up to date on things like long-term and spot volumes, and also just general news on the sector? Well, to get spot volumes, you basically need professional, um, you need a professional account and membership with the, with the price reporter, so with Trade Tech or UXC, um, which is quite expensive. But you can sign up for a free account at uxc.com, and you can get weekly updates on all of the the prices of all of the elements of the fuel cycle of of the spot price for U308 of the spot price for conversion and UF6 um, of the SWU price, which is the separate of work unit price or the cost of enrichment, and you can also see term prices. Uh, Cameco also publishes once a month on their website spot and term prices. So for for actual price data, um, those are good sources, and then there's also I don't have the link URL on the top of my head here, but Numerico, which publishes um, in updates on Twitter, kind of as they happen, different bids and offers, not necessarily trades, but updates to the bid and the ask and the, and the location for, um, for spot U308 uh, transactions. They update on Twitter um, as it happens at Numerico, that's N-U-M-E-R-C-O. Um, and on Numerico's website, 
you can also track um, the the spot prices and the transactions on Numerico's website as well. So that that's also really good, and that that source is free. So those are probably the best two two places. Yeah, this is one of the few sectors that you still have to make a phone call to get your updates. That's part of it, and and I know S and P Global is also looking to enter into some of the reporting as well with some of their services. Generally, these are services that cost a bit of money, but even the delayed data and even a few phone calls can get you close enough to what you need. Um, Justin, another question that came in, it can be taken a few ways and wasn't fully understood because of the email. Uh, the author who wrote the email was the uh, the email was bad um, in trying to mm. get clarification. But uh, what is your view on company presence on social media like Twitter? And if you agree with social media presence, which companies do you think do a good job with social media? Very few, I would say, do a good job with social media. I think that it's becoming increasingly relevant, um, especially on Twitter, because it seems like that's where a lot of the investing community is congregated. Um, Gosh, within the uranium space, I mean, Encore Energy is a new entrant into Twitter. I mean, they've been there for a while, but they've I think that they've just hired somebody new to manage their Twitter account potentially, but they're, they're really doing an excellent job with that account. They're, they're, they're posting a lot about relevant macro stuff and also engaging with people with questions. It's, I think that they're doing an excellent job. Um, let's see, Brandon Monroe, the CEO of Bannerman, he's pretty, uh, he's pretty frequent on Twitter as well, and you know, just an all-around great guy, extremely knowledgeable in the sector. Seems pretty engaged with with retail investors on Twitter as well. Um, gosh, off the top of my head, I'm trying to think if there's any others that are really doing it well. I mean, nothing else really stands out to me. There's a handful of others that have a page on there, and they'll tweet, you know, once a month or something like that. But th- those are the two that kind of stick out to me. Back to the news, the prior question. Folks definitely have to follow John Quakes on Twitter if you want frequent news. But again, that doesn't apply to the last question that Justin just answered. But but definitely follow John Quakes as far as news goes. Um, he sure. outperforms everybody when it comes to news. So definitely check on what he's doing. And Justin, to wrap up, just talk about your Uranium Insider service and the best way for the audience to reach out to you. We have a monthly newsletter service, so we send out a really thorough monthly letter at the beginning of every month, and that covers all of the companies that are on our focus list of stocks, our stock recommendations, as well as all the macro developments from the past month. We send out bulletins on occasion. Usually that's once, maybe twice a month. It really depends on the news flow that have to do with either urgent market um, kind of macro information or company updates from the companies that we follow. Um, it's an annual subscription. And like I said, we're, we're up pretty substantially since the, uh, since the inception of the letter. And we've really built a great community of folks. Uh, it's, been, it's been a really awesome experience for us. I've got, um, I've got a good team working with me, uh, including a former hedge fund manager with almost 40 years in the resource space. Um, so we've got some really um, strong professional backing that uh, is definitely helping with with the uh, with the content of the letter as well as the research. And um, yeah, folks can reach me through the website. There's a contact form on the website or through Twitter or uraniuminsider at gmail.com. And um, yeah, we're we're always looking for for new people to join and anybody can hit me up at any time with questions if they have questions about the newsletter. Well, Justin, it's been fun. I appreciate you coming back and talking to uh, our audience and good luck in the sector going forward. Thanks so much, Andrew. I really enjoyed it. And yeah, best of luck to you as well. Thank you.